But inside, the most intense weather on Earth. He's in trouble now, boy. 1st You know, hearing that wind squeal, at, you know, when it gets over 100 miles an hour, the wires and the, you know, you hear the roar going through the trees and, and you know, and it gets to the point you start hearing things breaking, glass breaking. And, but just hearing that roar and that scream in the wind, it's just fascinating. It, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to describe unless you've been there. Jim is a hurricane chaser. He's a member of the small fraternity that lives to be in the heart of the storm. And it's thanks to them we can take you inside the awesome power of a hurricane. When you're in hurricane force winds. Imagine being trapped in this stairwell the constant whine of the wind. The winds were so strong that the condominium walls were literally vibrating and shaking to such an extent that the glass, uh, the glass walls and the glass windows were just absolutely busting out and breaking out. The sound and the roar of that hurricane and the vibration from the intensity of the wind was one I'll never forget. Sound doesn't quit. Look at the water being blown through the cracks of the porch. Not even a concrete stairwell feels safe. It's bad enough being trapped in that stairwell. Can you imagine being out in winds that fierce? They said the eye is swatting whenever the last approach. Winds have no respect for man-made structures. yet to learn nature's tricks. Our buildings break, while trees merely bend to the will of the wind. 150, 160 now, easily. I got, I got typhoon insurance on my car. I hope I don't have to use it. are no match for a hurricane's wind. And the flying debris is very dangerous. The higher the wind gets, the more euphoric I feel, just seeing nature flex a muscle. This gas station's roof gives into the power of the wind. Sometimes you can get lucky and be in the right spot, but it's rare. Uh, you have to make that final adjustment, and once you're in that core, I mean, it's all hell breaking loose. It's not easy finding a safe spot in a hurricane. Yeah, move over there. I told you. Especially when you're getting video.
Imagine trying to shoot into the wind and rain. In fact, some of the most spectacular video has been shot from the relative safety of a car. Anyone caught in a hurricane won't soon forget the sting of the wind-driven rain. Hurricanes have another side, a side sometimes worse than wind. It's called surge, a rapid rise in water level that pushes on shore. Within minutes, surge transforms this parking lot, flooding cars their owners thought safe. Neither buildings nor people are safe from surge. Once the water starts rising, there is little that can be done to stop it. It goes wherever it wants. But once that water starts to rise, there's no, there's no getting out. So you have to realize that once you decide to stay in many places, your decision is nailed down. You can't change your mind at the last minute. I have to understand the sequence of events that could take my life. If I don't, I can be gobbled up by the, by the tidal surge more than anything. Storm surge takes even the most experienced chasers by surprise. That's what you call storm surge. I got a situation in Guam that I got surge coming in real fast. I knew what, what was going on because the storm wasn't that close yet. Storm surge is very, you know, serious, you know, and that's something that anybody, they say to get out, get out. As you can see, Jim moved to higher ground. But look and see how much water had inundated the spot where he was originally standing. Surge breaks boats away from their moorings and sends them into nearby homes. It sweeps inland and crashes into buildings hundreds of yards away from the waterfront. There was people in this apartment complex that said they had been living there since the 40s. And they said, oh, the storm, the water's never come over the, into this parking lot since 1947. And within two hours after that, the, the water was four feet deep in that parking lot, flushing all their furniture out of their apartments. Refrigerator adrift. Uh -huh. a refrigerator adrift. Dry streets rapidly become flowing rivers. Wind and water, the twin blows a hurricane delivers to a community. Seen here through the lens of a storm chaser's cameras, putting their lives at risk to be in the heart of a storm. Let them uh, take the risk. You can see the video and see what's out there without having to go out there yourself. Most of the time, we hope that they will have a safe haven to go to, but that is an issue, and sooner or later, somebody out there in very dangerous weather is going to be hurt. It may make for spectacular video, but nevertheless, uh, somebody might die. I really wouldn't suggest it to anybody. It's something you just have to have in your blood. I'll never quit until the storm stops me, or you know, it, I'll be doing this until you know, I'm 90 years old if I'm around that long. When we come back, Imagine a job where you have to stand in a hurricane before an audience in the tens of thousands. Storm Week is sponsored by the Home Depot. Come on, let's go. 
When a hurricane makes landfall, we expect to hear all about it from the comfort of our living rooms. But someone has to go out into the storm to bring you the pictures. This is their story. Each one has to be checked out. Mike Von Fremd, a correspondent with ABC News, has been covering hurricanes since 1985. There is something so exciting about a hurricane because it's a phenomenal thing that nature does. And it is so powerful. And all man can really do is stand back in awe and watch it. And I like to do that. Mike Von Fremd has been reporting from there throughout the morning. Amazingly, we've been able to get a picture. It is rather crude. But you can see Mike in silhouette there in New Iberia. You can see the effects of the winds. Mike, what's the situation? Charlie, it's just an awful situation, and we just don't have enough cable for our camera to take a picture of it. At the Holiday Inn here, they've just had a gas main break, and uh, families that have been looking to this place for shelter are now all scrambled in a parking lot on the other side. I'll read this to see if I... Mike's a veteran at covering storms for his network. But 1995 was different. That's when Hurricane Opal hit home, quite literally. The forecast called for a landfall at Destin, Florida, where Mike has a beach house. He headed there to cover a storm that had suddenly become very personal. Okay, we're making a decision here. Let's try When we drove over, and I've got to tell you, that was the longest drive across a bridge I've ever made because I couldn't see two inches. And that was frightening. But we made it across went into my place and watched my beach house, the deck being completely destroyed. And I tried to do a stand-up that I never put on the air because the lighting wasn't just right. This is my beach house in Destin, Florida. The tidal surge here is enormous. This is normally about 100 feet from the water. The waves are right on top of us. This is going to be destroyed. We're about to evacuate. The hurricane is just tremendous here. As conditions worsened, Mike tried one more report. Ready? Yeah. This is the northeast water of the storm on Beach House in Destin, Florida. The winds are quite literally ripping the ship apart. The tide is about 20 feet above the water. It was the event of a lifetime, even for such a highly experienced reporter. It was a rush of emotions. On the one hand, I was thrilled that I was at the right place, that I had a cameraman and a sound man, and we were, I believe, the only reporters really getting the brunt of that storm. And I felt pretty smart because I knew the area. On the other hand, it's a place that I loved, and I was watching it get ripped apart. And actually, during it, I didn't think it was going to still be standing. For TV reporters, it's all about being in the right place at the right time. That's what happened to a crew from WAVY-TV during Hurricane Emily. By about 4 o'clock, uh, all hell broke loose. And I had never seen anything like that before. The roof came off of the uh, store across the street, and the gas station awning fell down. Two hours into the height of the storm, things have gotten progressively worse. It's hard to even see 100 feet in front of us. At a certain point, the, the howl reached a different pitch that I'd never heard before. It was ferocious. It was, it was frightening. And it, it made you wonder if it was ever going to stop. As the wind increased, so did the waves. We reached a point uh, in the late afternoon where we were both a little concerned. Fortunately, we had to, you know, keep working, and it kind of kept our minds off of it. But I, I do remember looking at each other and thinking, you know, maybe this wasn't such a good idea. Maybe we should have taken the safer way out. This time, they got out okay. It was a, a, a harrowing few hours, and uh, at the same time, it was an awe-inspiring few hours. And uh, you don't forget something like that. It's, uh, it raises the hair on the back of your neck. It doesn't just look dangerous. It is those boards were coming off and watching those puppies rip loose and, and blow down the street it was a great video I remember getting ready to get out of the vehicle and a little voice said to me above the din you know, of all the blowing don't turn around so I didn't and that's when things went black I don't know how long I was out I couldn't have been for too long but when I came to I was laying on my back in the street it hurt <laughs> and I wasn't really sure where it hurt 
And what had happened, we figured later, was that one of the boards that we were getting ready to shoot had torn loose and had uh, had hit me from behind. The Weather Channel's Jeff Morrow had a similarly close escape covering Hurricane Floyd. And the, the whole ceiling crashed uh, and tiles were flying everywhere. Uh, we basically had to scramble for cover. Nobody was hurt, but uh, one of the uh, tiles and the wind blew a light into the camera and knocked the camera over and the camera was pretty much total. The Weather Channel, we're, we're pretty careful about that, I think. We'd like to get out and cover the storm. The business is very competitive and we want to be there. At the same time, we're very cognizant of what the risk might be and we're careful not to put people in a place where we think there's a substantial risk to their lives. That competitive pressure sometimes places reporters very close to the worst the storm has to offer. Wind is so high that when it whips, gee. These are the pictures you expect to see during the hurricane. Wind gusting up to 80 miles an hour. Shock here is, this is the coast. This is the Goldsboro, North Carolina, 80 miles inland. I'm only 20 yards away. This is to show you how difficult it is to only go 20 yards when you're in hurricane force winds. The sand is biting at your legs. It's, it's difficult to move, and it's just a constant, constant wind gusting, and it doesn't stop. The rain now is coming down extremely hard. And we can barely even see it. It's really a blinding rain now. And the winds are absolutely ferocious. Standing is quite difficult. The best advice I can give you tonight, if you logged on and tuned into this particular broadcast, stay home, ride this one out, and hopefully this thing will pull on through quick. Torrential rains are just sweeping across this area. It's all we can do to keep our footing on this roadway that leads right to Wrightsville Beach. The water sweeping over the banks, the winds whipping up more than 40 miles per hour, not a soul in sight here by the causeway. I mean, from a reporter's standpoint, from covering, you know, Mother Nature, what it can serve up, a hurricane is as exciting as it gets. I never wish a hurricane, but if there's going to be a hurricane, I kind of want to be in the middle of it because it is, in many respects, an ultimate story. What I find difficult now that I didn't earlier on in my career is being away from my family and knowing that my family is watching TV and worried, you know, and that and that bothers me. You stand there and you're literally in awe, just in awe of what Mother Nature can really do. I think it's the most amazing thing to cover a hurricane, to see the force of that storm and to see the force of that storm just calm down. It's amazing to me. Next, when a hurricane's so bad that not even reporters and chasers will go in, that's when a special kind of person steps forward. Storm Week is sponsored by The Home Depot. We found out what the important things in life are. Mm -hmm. You know, family, friends. Just, um, it's too bad it takes something like that to, to really, you know, find that out. If you think a hurricane is bad on land, try being caught at sea. No one would deliberately steer into something like that. No one except the U.S. Coast Guard, that is. When they get the call, they head out, even if it's into a hurricane. It was a boat race from Norfolk, Virginia to the Virgin Isles, and everything looked good for Roger and Judy Olson, his brother Roy, and Roy's wife Karen. But that didn't last long. Hundreds of miles to the south, a very bad storm was heading their way. Tropical Storm Mitch was about to change their lives forever. Thursday morning, they reforecast the tr track of the storm to 125 miles south of where it was on Wednesday. And so that put us right, our path was going to hit right in the middle and we couldn't do anything about it. When Roy said that we weren't going to uh, 
be able to make it out of the storm. We had to, you know, prepare for it. It was really unsettling. The winds gusted to 60 knots, and the seas were very rough. I was, you, know, you don't, I don't know how you can describe it, because it was noise from, from the, the water hitting and, mm -hmm. and, and just the wind blowing. And we just sort of huddled together and talked to our kids and thought that we really didn't know if we were going to make it. Then a large wave turned their world upside down. And none of us really have any re real clear recollections of what happened when we rolled, except that Roy says that he thought that we had been possibly been hit by a freighter. We think he got jammed into the, the ceiling, and uh, that's what broke his back. The Compresca was floundering. They set off their distress signal. Within five hours, a Coast Guard Z-130 found them, but it could not pick them up, nor could a nearby freighter. The freighter was, you know, so much bigger than we were, and, and it would, um, you know, be going like this, and then the freighter at one point came down and hit our boat, and we thought it was going to take us down. When the freighter started moving, backing off from us, um, you could see the big propeller, a huge propeller coming up out of the water. You know, you and we were really close to it. Very close to it. Um, mm -hmm. I think I was probably just as scared there as any place else. And so a Coast Guard helicopter headed into the storm from Elizabeth City, North Carolina, to rescue the family. At 900 miles, the trip was both long and dangerous. When they said Bermuda, it makes your heart race a little faster. Bermuda is about the furthest we could go with the helicopter uh, without needing to refuel and that's landing on fumes. They just made it to the island and refueled. They found the Compresca at daybreak, 230 miles southwest of Bermuda. It, uh, it was Incredible. great. It was, a, it was so nice to know that there was someone out there that knew where we were. Rescue swimmer Sean Lansing was lowered into the ocean. The boat itself was uh, a mess as far as the, the mass being broken, the, the waves had it rocking back and forth violently. I had to hold on to what I could on that boat or I would have been tossed off, so it was challenging. One by one, the crew was lifted to safety. They were the real heroes. Uh, they lasted on that boat for 48 hours. My rescue lasted in all of 20, 25 minutes. And so I, what they went through was amazing. I think it was a life-changing experience for all four of us. I, I mean, uh, I know, I speaking for myself, um, I know it is, makes me a lot more uh, aware of family and what's really important. The Compresca's crew owe their lives to the Coast Guard's willingness to fly into almost any kind of weather. Elizabeth City Coast Guard Station was in the path of Hurricane Floyd, they still flew out to help a badly injured seaman aboard a freighter. The further we got offshore, the worse the weather conditions got. Uh, the winds steadily increased, the size of the waves kept increasing, to the point where I have never seen the, the ocean look quite that angry. The ship's containers had torn loose and crushed the crewmen. I've never seen a ship that big act like what this ship was doing. Uh, the bow uh, literally was uh, under a wave, and normally the bow of a 600-foot freighter is you know, a good 50 feet out of the water. The conditions made it impossible to drop a rescue swimmer. I was really concerned was when our rescue swimmer was swinging around trying not to hit the ship. Uh, I was really getting concerned that, that we were going to hurt him. other option was to lower a basket and let the ship's crew load up their injured friend. And the whole time we were hovering there in, in hurricane turbulent winds, 50, 50 foot waves, uh, bouncing the ship around. And essentially I'm tied to this ship right now because I don't want that cable to come off the deck because uh, then I'd have to do the whole thing over again. Even when the injured man was finally aboard, he was far from safe. No flight is routine in a hurricane, and home was a long way away. This helicopter is uh, capable of doing it. 
and that's what I train to do and that's what I'm paid to do. And this is the best job in the world to get to go help people that need need helping. So yeah, I'd do it, I'd do it again tomorrow, no problem. Imagine being stuck right in the heart of a hurricane and having a camera with you to document the drama. Incredible home video of a hurricane's wrath coming up next. I wanted to stay. Megan, Megan was ready to go, but I kind of wanted to stay and uh, check out the storm. I had never been in a full-fledged hurricane before. I need a heavier camera. So far, we've showed you people who go through hurricanes for a living. But what's it like for an ordinary person to go through one? What follows are first-hand accounts from people who were caught in a hurricane and who happen to have a video camera. Slowly but surely throughout the day, it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And in the, in the middle of the whole thing, I remember all of us were just like, when is this going to stop? It's really kicking. There's trees going. Basically, you know, I, I was in the water, so I, I was up to my up to my neck in the water, and I, I didn't feel any of the winds at that point. I was just holding holding the camera and basically, you know, filming what was going on around me. Right, right now it's 105 sustained waves. Hurricane George is kicking our butt. Oh, it was awesome. I mean, you know, when. You, you're out there in the in the middle of this and you know I couldn't even go in the house I was just like in awe looking at the wind and it you know it kept me uh, on the edge of my seat after eight hours Hurricane George wound down luckily their home had little damage but they did gain a new respect for the power of a hurricane if I knew that it was going to be the same strength as Hurricane George I would stay there if I had any thoughts that it might go over that, I would leave because that was just about as much as I could handle. Hurricane George was a category two hurricane with winds over 100 miles an hour. I mean, in a major hurricane or a category four or five hurricane, the Florida Keys for the most part will be completely underwater and those people will be killed if they're standing there by those uh, flotilla home docks as they were in some of the hurricanes in the last few years. So absolutely, I think a lot of people don't realize how dangerous it can really be in major hurricanes. I was totally amazed at the power of the hurricane. Um, never, ever, ever, there's nothing to compare it to. I've never experienced anything like that before in my life. It was just, it was just phenomenal. Mark and Megan were lucky to be on land. Not so William McQueen. He rode out Hurricane Luis in 1995 on his boat in St. Martin Harbor. He's in, he's in trouble now, boys. Oh, my God. Well, the big one missed him. The same storm transformed the Prom family's summer vacation on St. Martin. Oh, man. Got some damage. Wind's got to be in excess of 100 miles an hour. Big wave. See that one coming in? That's a big wave. passed over them. The wind changed direction. Now we've got the 140 mile winds coming at us. I'm looking through a pane of glass. It's about ready to blow. I think I'm going to get there.
sometimes in a hurricane, you're just as likely to drown on land as you are at sea. That's next. Storm Week is sponsored by Gateway, where you've got a friend in the business. It was just awesome. It's the winds of a hurricane that people are afraid of. But it should be the flooding, like in Hurricane Floyd. Now, Floyd was a very major hurricane when it was offshore, but it actually made landfall as a much weaker hurricane, so the impact on the coast wasn't that great. But nevertheless, it uh, did produce torrential rains and flooding and a lot of damage that way. We got a call about 10 o'clock that night uh, that uh, uh, the flooding had uh, grown much more widespread. It was rising rapidly, and that there were hundreds and hundreds of people stranded on tops of houses, barns, and in trees that were needing immediate rescue. Survivors have dramatic stories to tell. Dr. Harry Fish and his wife Josephine were asleep as floodwaters knocked down their door. But we never thought of water coming in the house because we'd never had that before, even with bad storms that we'd had. So we just thought, well, but we didn't hear it. When we went to bed that night, there was a little wind and um, we could hear just a little rain. And we thought, well, this won't be nearly as bad as they say it is. But it was. All across eastern North Carolina, people needed to be rescued. I noticed about a quarter of a mile away, there were some tractor trailers at an intersection, and it looked like they were uh, pretty much uh, in danger. They were surrounded by water, and the water looked to be moving rather rapidly. We noticed that there was a driver in the first truck, and he was just staring at us. The other driver, as soon as we pulled up to the truck, decided that he was getting out then and there and making obvious that he wanted to get out of there. The water was rising rapidly. They rescued both drivers, but their night had just begun. On the ground, Harry and Josephine Fish had their own problems. Really, it was frightening. It was one of those things where you looked at the water and you thought, don't believe this, this can't be happening. We're getting out of here. See the water mark right there, and that's nine feet and it, the entire bottom of the house was to that point. All the inside. They scrambled to an upstairs balcony. We came right down here because the boat was, the boat was right at this corner, right here, and we went right over the side. I remember putting my foot on that side and then stepping right down in the boat. As they were stepping to safety, the Coast Guard was staying busy. But before we even got towards the area where the people needed rescue, we would find, you know, 10, 20, 30 people en route to the rescue area that need rescue. Over 300 people were plucked out of the water that night by helicopter. Many more were rescued by boat. Among the lucky ones, Harry and Josephine Fish. They escaped, but their home was destroyed, uninhabitable. They had lost everything. But we realized that Losing all that was not, um, not too bad because we all had each other. Make you realize that certain things are important and certain things are not. The to describe that uh, in many ways I felt like, in some ways I felt like we were saying goodbye. I, I, um, I mean, it was that serious. Dan Goldenberg is a research meteorologist at the National Hurricane Center Research Division in Miami, Florida. He studies hurricanes and is used to flying through them. But none of that could prepare him for what happened to him and his family during Hurricane Andrew. It all started a few hours before landfall with the birth of his fourth child, daughter Pearl. I really decided Barbara was okay in the hospital. The hospital was a very strong structure. I went home to uh, be with the children. Benjamin, Joseph, Aaron. I remember getting inside and thinking, gee, it's nice to be prepared, nice to be safe. Uh, vividly remember that feeling. Hi, Daniel, say hi. hi. The beginnings of Andrew. Uh, this is just one little squall. We have much more to go. So anyway, this is just 8 o'clock at night. Six hours later, Stan realized he was no longer just going to watch the storm. You can see it's just about over us. He was going to be part of it. Order 
till 4 in the morning Miami time. You can see the radar picture. This is the most intense part of the hurricane right here. And we are located about right here. We will probably get the eye pass right over us. Okay, we, have we just hunker down because it was getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, the power is out, so I don't know if you can see anything, and we can hear things start to fly around up there. I'm sure we're approaching hurricane force winds. Oh, it's coming. Okay. When the eye wall hit, it was like someone just took a big gearbox and just revved it right up. In the hallway of the Goldenberg House, winds outside, I think, are at least 100, 110 miles an hour or more. We lost the plywood on the front window. And when the plywood ripped off the front window, uh, we knew that the front, next thing, the front picture window might go. And sure enough, at a certain point, it just exploded. And we had a hurricane just ripping through the house. They tried to move into the garage, but it was gone. They huddled together against the kitchen wall. That's when Stan decided that survival was more important than shooting video. I was really scared. I mean, I kept on telling my dad, hold on to me, dad, hold on to me. Um, it was just really terrifying. I was constantly thinking of my three sons at home with my husband. It kept getting worse and worse. And then at a certain point, my brother-in-law said, the roof is down. We found out later that the entire roof had ripped off, carrying the concrete tie beam with it in one piece. It flew off and smashed into a neighbor's house. They escaped and went to the only safe place left, their car. As we were praying, all of a sudden, bang, bang, bang on the top of the car, and the neighbor had risked their life come across the street and saw the devastated house, saw the light on in the car, and came and asked if we wanted to take refuge in their house. Where they finished out the hurricane. And as you can see, we have no house. The ordeal has given Stan a new perspective on his work. As we fly out in other storms, we keep in mind what happened to us in Hurricane Andrew and we're, we have much more compassion, much more concern for other people and what they might be going through even in a storm substantially weaker than Andrew. Different people react to the experience of being in a hurricane in different ways. Some can't wait for the next storm. Others wait for their next assignment. Rescuers wait for the distress call they know will come. But most people hope they never have to go through a hurricane again. We were extremely terrified. And I'm a man of real faith. And in the midst of it, it was terrifying. Uh, we thought uh, it was very likely we were going to die. The wind and the sound of it and hearing things crash outside that you can't, um, you don't know what it is. But just the sound of the wind, more than anything else. I don't ever hear that again. I hope I never hear that again.